Thank you all for coming to One Million Cups today. I know this is um, sort of a different uh, atmosphere for us, um, but it's for good reason. Um, this group has grown so much uh, beyond my wildest dreams for the program that uh, we've actually are doubling the seating space in labs right now. So we are in construction mode, but should be back in there next week. Right, Jen? Yeah. yeah. OK, next week. Cool. Um, as always, I want to go through just a couple of announcements. This is a very busy time of year. Um, so first and foremost, um, when you ask questions today, there's three different microphones around. And since we still are live streaming, um, I'd ask that you could, uh, if you could make a line at one of the mics or go up to one of the mics, uh, that would be great. So that way we can hear the entire presentation. Um, also, uh, the pipeline to be, uh, or the deadline to be a pipeline entrepreneur is October uh, 29th. Uh, so if you're still interested in that, you have just a few days to apply. Um, We've been working with Rarewire, which is a local startup in town, uh, doing different app development sessions. So if you want to learn how to build native apps, we have free courses that you can attend. It's pretty awesome. So we have a beginner's level that uh, kicked off a couple weeks ago. So uh, I think you're too late on that round. But uh, the level two, so if you're an advanced um, developer or want to get into using the wire language, um, you can sign up online. So just um, go to Kaufman.org and you can find it there. Let's see. Now, last announcement. Uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week is coming up, second week of November. Lots of great events. There's going to be over 30 events that week. Um, but a couple that I want to highlight that you, that you need to sign up for. Um, I'm doing a startup job crawl. Uh, I've been working with UMKC, Rockers University, um, and a couple other groups in town. If you're a startup looking for interns, so unpaid interns or part-time workers or full-time employees, um, let me know and then we can get you signed up and you can attend. We're gonna have, I think, over 200 students and recent grads attending, so it's a great place to recruit for your startup. Um, let me know if you're interested and um, we'll get everything plugged in for that. Uh, two others, um, Startup Weekend is going to be awesome. It's going to be hosted here in this space. So um, you do need to sign up for that. I think the cost is $60 or, or maybe $80. Um, but that will cover your meals and everything for the 54-hour weekend. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. If you haven't been to a Startup Weekend before, uh, it's a great experience. And then last but not least, we've been talking a lot about this, but um, Demo day is coming up, so uh, I think we've already closed um, applications for that. But if um, if you'd like to attend, please let us know. Please come. Please plan on attending. It's going to be a, a great actual demo of the great products out there. So with all that said, that's a lot of announcements. Um, I want to get out of the way because I'm very excited to announce our first startup who's going to be presenting here. Uh, we have Hunter and Will from Fanect, and they are, uh, Fanect is the first competitive mobile network that rewards fans for their level of commitment to their favorite team. So if you're, if you're a sports fan, this is going to be a great product for you. Um, Hunter, Will, come on up. Morning, guys. Um, I'm Hunter Browning. I'm the president of Finect, and this is my partner Will. Um, we kind of got started. It's been a, a bit, been a quick little process for us. Um, we started about three months ago, and on our go live day, we'll be about a three and a half month project from um, concept to funding to development. So we've been we've been running at full pace here. Just to give you a little background, um, we met through a, uh, pro, a uh, school program in Blue Valley called CAPS. Um, we're both got sports backgrounds. I played college football. Hunter played soccer over in England for a little bit. So we, we definitely have a, a passionate sports background, kind of where the idea was born. Um, but if you want to. So what FNEC does, it answers one question. Who has the best fans? So do we have any MU fans in here? A few. KU fans? Right. So who, who's better, right? 
And so you have that same argument that goes back and forth. Okay, we'll see you guys basketball season. We'll see you guys football season. There needs to be one kind of standard evaluation for, the, for teams to compete on. So what we do at Finect is we allow users, our fans, the fans of these teams to compete through all these various games, earn points for their teams, and actually represent the fan base of their university or pro team. So the way we, we did that, we had to ask ourselves if there was you know, millions of people using this app, you know, whoever was at the top of the leaderboard um, for their team, that had to be a distinguishable, distinguishable person. That had to be someone that was actually the number one fan at the university. So inside of Finect, the way you prove who has the best fans is we have these games. Um, each of the games measures either passion, dedication, or knowledge of the sport or the team. And they're all very low friction, non-intrusive ways to, to measure these things. So yeah, as you can see, there's, we, I mean, again, the, the games are, are very easy to play. They're fun to do. Um, some of the examples are, are guessing the score, just simply guessing the score of the game, getting a picture of the player, you can get points. Um, checking into games, you can get points. Obviously, with Foursquare, they've proven the concept that people will do crazy things to climb a leaderboard just for checking into places. So um, we kind of married that concept with, with the problem, which is that everybody, wants, everybody thinks they're the best sports fans or thinks their team has the best sports fans. But uh, there's no way to prove that. So Finex's goal is to be the first platform that quantifies what it means to be a sports fan and actually give people an answer who actually does have sports, the best sports fans. Right, and all our games were designed to be centric around things that are already going on in fans' life. So we, by, by our goal to embed, and it was initially the college demographic, which is a tricky, tricky one to get into because they can fill out a lot of um, insecurities and products. Uh, one of our things was we didn't want to add anything to their day-to-day -day thing. So everything we've done is designed around things that fans are already doing, and we're just merely rewarding them and adding a point value to these things. So the whole thing's designed to be no friction, non-intrusive, just a part of their life that's very, very seamless. Definitely. So there's two different objectives inside of the, inside of the game, right? So um, if I'm a KU fan, I can compete to be the number one fan at the University of Kansas. And then collectively, teams can compete against each other. So there's kind of a dual-edged sword there. There's dual purpose, two objectives. Um, but, but the idea is for people who are fans of a team, fans of a sport, um, to compete to be the number one fan of that team or sport. And then the teams then can compare against each other. So the web piece of this mobile app is going to be just a giant leaderboard to where you can see how you're contributing to your team. You could compare MU fans to Chiefs fans. You could compare. Um, Sporting KC fans to KU fans, vice versa, conferences to conferences. Uh, we're going to be building some functionality inside the app to actually let um, frats at universities compete to see who has the best uh, fans inside their, inside their frat. So the, the whole idea of being able to see, number one, how you're contributing to your team, and then number two, um, again, who has the best sports fans across, across any, any vertical. So between sports, between teams and frats if, if we get it. Um, with, with us, obviously, as, as a lot of startups right now, we're based a lot off lean principles because that's obviously the, kind of the Bible of our world right now. Um, we got some really great advice from the author of Running Lean who said, we love your concept. We love that we think users will use it. But the one thing that's going to be key to your guys' success is the rollout. And he came to us and he said, you know what, everything in your app is a game. And everything in your app directs back to your competition. That's part of our user psyche. Why not make the rollout part of a game? So what we're doing <coughs> is we're open to NCAA schools, all of them for basketball and football. We're open to MLB, NBA, NHL, MLS, and NFL. But if you're not a Kansas, Kansas or Missouri team, um, your, your activation requires a certain amount of users. So if you were to get on from New York, <coughs> what you'll see is you'll still be able to get on a profile. You'll still be able to access some of the stuff and see how cool the app is, because aesthetically, we've put a lot, a lot of effort in, and that's something we want to use to draw our users in. <clears throat> but as soon as you start to play the games, it'll inform you that here's a sign signing bonus for being one of our initial users. <clears throat> go ahead and go out and recruit this many more so that we can activate your network. Um, that, for us, is for two purposes. One, to control our growth out so that we're not managing 10 users from one section and another from other so that we can have large concentrations and try to bump those concentrations up to where we hit viral growth at each point. And then two, to make that desire at each election. So <clears throat> if, you're, if you're fighting to get that and everyone's pushing out their Facebook friends and their Twitter friends, hopefully we'll be able to boost those quick enough that it will be able to catch on virally. Um, so it's, it's controlled, and then it's also going to encourage the, the viral growth hope, that we hope to attain as soon as we can get it. And just to, just to expand on that, so when he mentioned kids from Missouri, so our rollout strategy was to turn on 
so to speak, the networks of the University of Kansas and MU. We figured that if we launched this app at the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri, and those two schools bought into the concept, you had fans competing, and uh, our time's up. Fans competing and, and buying into the concept that it would work for any team on the planet, any, any sport on the planet. So um, that's the idea. We're gonna turn on those, those, those two schools in addition to Sporting KC, the Royals, and the Chiefs. And then, like he said, we're gonna set a, an arbitrary level of fans that have to um, register for, for Finect to turn on those teams, like you said, to control growth and to, and to uh, help us out that way. So, so I think at this time, are we good for questions? If anybody's got questions? Yeah. Anybody questions? Did you guys get the concept? Does it make sense? Perfect. It's a good thing. So if there's no questions, I guess we did a good job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Games on the app. Ooh, hi. Sorry. Uh, what's an example of one of the games on the app? Like you mentioned, those games are interactive and they're integrated into life. I was a student at KU, so what would be an example of what I would have experienced? Right. So on, on game day, one, one of the very first things you can do is you can simply turn on your game face. That's a, a, a game that actually came out of a concept of fraternities where they're going around waking, waking the guys up on game day like, hey, everybody get pumped. This is simply literally a toggle switch where you're flipping on your, your game face, saying that you're, you're in the mode. And then on your roster, which is really your friends list for us, you can see who has their game face on for that day. Um, so then as your day progresses and you're getting up to tailgating time, you can check into the stadium and the tailgating area. You can start guessing the score for the, for the match. You can start guessing impact players as far as if it's basketball, leading point scorer. Um, there's, there's tons of different stuff like that. There's, and the other thing we've tried to do is fantasy football is great, and it's obviously a huge industry, but <clears throat> it takes a lot of time to play fantasy football, and you have to be extremely knowledgeable. One thing we've done is we've designed Finect games so that my girlfriend, who's not a huge sports fan, could play them at a game. So there's, there's stuff like spirit wear competitions, and you can vote people up and down, and just very simple things like that, so that, <clears throat> yes, we will have games for people who are really knowledgeable to sports, but we're also gonna have people, games for people who are into the social aspect of sports, because obviously with collegiate sports, that's, I mean, that's a huge part of it for, for the majority of people. So there's, there's tons of games like that, and those will rotate in and out based off user usage and different things like that. One, one of the reasons Finect was born was because um, one of our friends put a picture of him and, and Thomas Robinson on Facebook. Nobody commented. That's a huge problem. That's a huge deal in a sports fan's life. And so um, what the concept was, was that, uh, that we need to build a platform where that gets due credit. And if we turn that into a game, I mean, you can see where the idea just kept evolving. But to, to so, so one, of the, one of the highest point values inside of Finect is getting a picture with the player. That's one of the hardest things to do. So. Um, you'll see, in, I mean, you, you only get, say, a point for turning your game face on, but it's, it's positive reinforcement. It's showing, showing the fans and, and people inside the network on Finect that your, your head's in the game. Um, one, of, one of the things that isn't going to be built in the first version, but we're really excited about, so you can check in the game to get points, similar to Foursquare. Um, what we want to do is build um, a, a game called Watch Party, so that people in Overham Park who aren't always going to Lawrence to watch games can drop a pin, geocache their house, and then have to get five people to come check into their, to their watch party. They get points, everybody gets points, and, and it's rewarding, again, that dedication. So, again, I'll, I'll say it over and over again. That my, me and uh, or Hunter and, and our partners always make fun of me, but the games are very low friction, non-intrusive actions. Simple stuff. Guess the score, get points. That's, that, guessing the score and being dead on shows a lot of knowledge of the sport. That's extremely hard to do. Checking in the games, it's showing dedication, passion, your game face, I mean, different stuff like that. So it's, again, all, all to measure and quantify who has the best sports fans. Does that make sense? We've also incorporated the feedback loop, the lean feedback loop in there. And one of our games initially is for users to be able to suggest a game. So you get a, a game title block and 140 characters to suggest a game that you think would be beneficial for fans. Um, and so for our first, One a day. Yeah, for our phase one, that'll be something that we're, we're using as a feedback loop as, as far as so that we can tailor this specifically to what our users want. Okay, I guess I'm up now. Um, I'm sort of interested, especially Hunter, uh, could you talk a little bit about your experience in the CAPS program and your journey as an entrepreneur? Yeah, um, 
So if, for those who don't know, the CAPS program is the Center for Advanced Professional Studies, and it's a high school supplement. Um, so I started it my junior year. I went a semester of my junior year, three days a, or three hours a day, um, and focused on engineering. My background's actually in engineering and physics mainly, um, with a little bit of psychology. But I went there, and then my senior year, I, I'd fallen in love with the program my junior year and went all day except two hours. But I went back to my home high school. And basically what you do there is it's a, a state-of-the-art facility that is more advanced than most, most state colleges anywhere in the country. And what they do is they bring in professionals to teach classes who've been through the industry. So I went through architecture, um, did stuff with Black and Veatch, went through automated systems um, with a guy who, who was actually the president of automated systems. Um, tons and tons of great experience like that. That program <coughs> got me into a place where I could do some experimental hydrogen research. Um, I spent kind of the two years I was there working on a new hydrogen technology, which when I <coughs> kind of got to a point where I was happy with that, obviously to, to get anything to actually happen, you have to form a company around it. And, um, building that company kind of got me hooked on the entrepreneurial experience. So leaving CAPS, um, I had the Finect idea in the summer and um, ended up fortunately getting a team that was good enough and had enough experience because I'm 18 right now, so I, my connections are, are limited. Um, so brought all these guys on board and we've been, been moving quickly ever since. But the program for me has been really great because I was never that student that was like the 4.0 guy. Um, and I was always focused on doing things outside of school and CAPS really, they don't have a, a GPA restriction or anything, and they really put a lot of emphasis on finding what you're good at and just exploiting that to as far as you can take it. Um, I'm a freshman at KU right now. I'm actually taking next semester off to, to run with the FNEC team and get this to where it needs to be, hopefully by the start of next school year. Um, but it's, it's been a great experience because we've met lots of industry people. I had the experience of actually doing stuff out in the field and not just lectures and things like that. So it's, I mean, it's been a huge part of kind of my trip up to here. Um, that, that covers the program pretty well, I think. There's also an accelerator inside the CAPS program that um, is actually a class, and he designed it, which he won't tell you, but I'll tell it for you. Okay. Do you have to go through any approval process with the colleges, with the teams? Because I know, like, NFL has stringent right. things. <clears throat> what, we've, what we've done, too, is to avoid all the licensing problems, because one of our first problems is a lot of the licensing that each each college takes 15%, and obviously there's only so many 15% that can be taken. Um, so one of our initial problems was that, and we were very worried about that, all the college content that is on our site, so logos and stuff like that, is actually uploaded by our users. So just as if you were to go out and put a KUJ as your Facebook profile, Facebook's not liable for that. On our profile, you've got your profile, and then you've got a team logo behind there. We allow you to upload your favorite team logo. So it could be a retro Jayhawk, it could be anything. So it's kind of like a cover photo on Facebook, um, but that way we're not liable for it. So yeah, because that, that was a huge concern because those guys don't play around and, and we don't have the money to play around with those guys or the time or anything. So that was one of our initial things that we had to figure out very quickly. A good question though. Yeah. What are the, what are the three things that you can do over the next 30 days that will have the highest impact on your business? Highest impact. <laughs> um, we're about to come out in KU's preseason basketball guide that is coming out to 250,000 people. Um, and what we're actually doing, actually KU fans here, if, when you get that guide, there's the, the link basically pre-registers and there's a chance to win a signed basketball by the whole team and coach self. Um, we've actually been working with IMG, if anyone's familiar with that. They are in charge of marketing for about 80 colleges and a bunch of pro teams. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're doing a huge influx on marketing. Um, through Allen Fieldhouse and at Missouri as well. And we're actually running an A-B test right now um, at KU and then also at Missouri. So at Missouri, we're doing a more grassroots effect. Um, and at, at KU, we're kind of going more of the corporate marketing through, through the jumbotrons and stuff like that. But basically, we want to see before we go live everywhere, whether to infiltrate a college demographic, we can use grassroots stuff and we can use promotions at the bar and we can use Finex sponsored nights and stuff like that. Um, to, to really get in there, or if we have to do spend the, the marketing dollars as far as FNAC logos up on the Jumbotron and, and kiosk is inside the stadiums and stuff. So right now we're running that, that A-B test um, over the next, we go live November 14th, and from now until then we're, we're starting that A-B test slowly. Our other problem is that we can't overhype an app too soon because obviously if you, if you market an app and it's not there relatively close to your marketing, people are like, well, what the hell, it's why, why can't I download this? So. Um, we're, we're doing that test and we're ramping it up slowly so that we can see once we do start experiencing growth at, at other locations that are not right here for us to put our hands on, how we can most efficiently do that. 
I would say to answer your question, awareness is number one, just getting the awareness out that there's an app out there that's trying to prove who has the best sports fans. Um, number two, development talent, um, the more the merrier, obviously, uh, with, with an app that has potential for a lot of growth, you want um, the best developers working on that app. Um, and the third thing I would say, more awareness. Yeah, I've just got uh, an easy question, I think. What is your value proposition, or how do you make money? Um, as of right now, and actually, and that's a good one because it's changed nonstop. Um, so when we first created the app, everything we designed about the app was, was kind of off an Instagram model of don't put up banner ads, don't just keep it as genuine for the users as possible, and then um, with the idea of, of a user value in, in the end, right, for acquisitions or whatever, whatever comes of that. But obviously that doesn't keep the lights on, so what we've done is we've built in a bunch of revenue models that we feel we've done relatively creatively. Um, one would be all of our games can be sponsored. So instead of banner ads or pop-ups, um, a brand, and one thing we're working on with IMG is trying to get them to help out with this since they sell marketing spaces at colleges, a brand can buy a game and pay per traction, and each of our games is configurable per university or team. So UPS is a huge sponsor of KU. UPS can come in and sponsor the attendance streak. So when you're clicking the attendance streak, it'll be attendance streak and UPS's logo or whatever. Um, and that's, so like if a brand only has certain marketing budgets, we can show which games have the highest traction. Another huge thing we've done is um, our, our data sales that we'll basically have off fans. Um, most, I believe the statistic was 97.3% of sports teams don't know anything about their, about their fans. Uh, we had a meeting with Sporting Innovations, the guys responsible for Sporting KC Stadium, which is unbelievable. And this, that's kind of a huge aspect of theirs is because what they're doing is letting, letting these teams draw connections with their, with their fans because, and they've seen huge, huge growth in, and revenue from sales in stadium, sales online, stuff like that, because they're more tied in, they understand the people who are in their venues now. So one thing is we will have tons and tons of data as far as what these people are doing, where they're doing it, everything about, about the fan aspect. And then um, thirdly, we also have APIs as far as um, data that, that other companies could use to, use to build platforms. And, and that's something that obviously won't go on sale right away because we're gonna need a bit of a head start. Um, but that's a little bit more down the road. API licensing is another one, and there's probably a few have I forgotten. Well, just to touch on the marketing too, um, third-party marketing inside of an app is kind of a bad word. So what we're what we're leaning towards is more third-party sponsorships, um, which is which is what he touched on, sponsoring those games. So uh, a good example of that, um, ESPN has the Coors Heart, Coors Light Cold Hard Facts six pack six pack of questions. Um, you and I don't care that they said. Coors Light, I mean, it's a very low friction, non-intrusive way to market, um, and, and it, but it's brand awareness. So um, obviously you have enough user growth, you, you start doing math behind the impressions and the CPM. Um, based on what IMG is selling Facebook posts for, um, for KU's, KU Athletics Facebook page, there's absolutely some value. And sports, um, sports fans are a very sought after demographic, and then that being the secondary, our, our kind of secondary uh, audience right now, because our primary is college students. Getting in, having an app that <clears throat> is absolutely being embedded into the college lifestyle um, means a lot of money to somebody. That's extremely valuable to big brands because because college students are are extremely hard to get in front of. They're, they're, they're about going, to have a lot of disposable income. So. Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, I got here a little bit late, so I hope nobody's already asked this question, but um, first of all, I think I'd probably echo most people in the room it, whenever I say, like, I think it's awesome that you're 18 and doing this. Like, that's incredible. Um, yeah. <laughs> so my question has to do with that a little bit. Um, I'm the guy doing Homes for Hackers, and my first hacker is Mike Demery, who he's in here somewhere. A bunch of you guys have probably met him. Um, and he's 20, and we were discussing this in the car this morning about, um, you know, he has this theory that young people his age, your age, really have an edge on entrepreneurship, building things that will be the future. Um, and, uh, you know, we're kind of arguing back and forth because I'm, you know, not his generation, any, I guess. Uh, so kind of what's your thought on that? And also what, what advice would you give to... Um, someone that's in your age range that's struggling with decisions like, should I go to college? Should I start a company? I've got this idea. Um, like, how do you how do you make those decisions? Um, you have to tell them about the paper you just wrote. 
Uh, well, two things. One, I actually have a, a book out on the topic that when I was, when I was trying to learn the entrepreneurial process, a, a huge problem for me was, <clears throat> I mean, like everyone in this room, you don't sleep anyway. So when you're getting two or three hours a night of sleep, you don't have time to read 500 page books that have huge antecedents of guy's life that isn't really point on for me. Um, so I have a, a hundred page book out and I limited myself to a hundred pages when I was writing it because I wanted, wanted to do was I kind of tracked my whole experience from the start of my junior year to about now and everything I've learned and then only the lessons I've learned. There's no stories, there's no pieces and parts. So um, one, of my, one of my things is everyone we work with and we try to bring in, we try to bring as young as possible because I do think young people can move faster. But our main advantage is we have no risk right now. So I have no mortgage, I have no family, I have nothing, I really have no responsibility <coughs> besides Finect. So if I, if I run Finect until I can and it flops, I can go back to college and I can keep doing that. There's real no, no real threat right now. Whereas if I do it when I'm 35, I do it when I'm 40, and, and my thing flops that I've been putting tons of time in, now I've got a family and I've got stuff I actually have to pay for. So I think, I think we have a huge, huge advantage. And I think it's just a matter of being able to make that commitment. So. I mean, I didn't make it to a single dance of my, my last two years of high school or any, and so a lot of the, the big aspect is social stuff. So I mean, I managed to do all this while, while playing high level sports and I've been able to, I'm actually an engineering physics student at KU. Um, so it's, it's doable with other stuff, it really is, and it's just a matter of priorities. So uh, again, I haven't been out a single night of college. So that's, that's a little bit different than some of my peers. But um, I think that innovation is really, really great with our generation because we're, we're kind of in the midst of everything right now. Not that it's not technologically advanced to everybody, but we seem to have a higher aptitude for the things that are being brought in at a younger age and able to learn it faster. And so I think that drives a huge piece of that innovation because so we're constantly seeing, we're constantly clicking about stuff. And people all the time have great ideas and come up to me and they're, and they're my age. I'm like, yeah, go act on it. And they're like, well, it's just like, it's, it's really that matter of taking that leap. And actually for the CAPS program, that's a huge part for me because I had always been that idea guy and I was kind of a garage tinkerer. And um, CAPS kind of brought me into this place where people value those skills and people kind of showed me, hey, if, if you're willing to put in the work, stuff will come of this. So I, I think we have a huge, huge unfair advantage. Um, I think it's just not, as, not utilized as much as it could be. So he wrote a paper in, in one of his oh. classes. Yeah. Um, it, it was, the paper was supposed to be, what was the topic of the paper? Just his, his view of, of the value of a college degree and I'll just tell you the title of the paper. It was the $60,000 stamp. I, I absolutely am all for the concept of learning and I, I love, love to learn and I read nonstop and stuff. Um, and I'm a big, big self teacher, but my problem with colleges is I feel it's got a little corporate as far as <clears throat> some of the things that we're learning seem to be slowed down and some of the things that we're learning are a little bit behind as far as, so my world is physics and we're not teaching the, the most current things and, and my, part of my problem is how can you teach the most current thing when it has to be used, liked by industry, put into a curriculum, approved by teachers, adopted by teachers, and then taught. So by the time I'm learning something, industry is four, five, six years ahead of me. Um, so that's why actually with, with Rivet, if anyone's familiar with architecture stuff, I learned that in about two months at the, uh, the CAPS facility and went to Black and & Veatch and they yet had employees that didn't know Rivet. So I think the pursuit of an, a higher education is extremely valuable. I just think the format of a, of a traditional college can be lacking right now. But I mean, there's tons to be said for that safety net of a college degree still. All right, guys, let's give them a big round of applause. That was amazing. All right, we're going to have uh, the guys from Kansas City Startup Village do their presentation again. Um, I think this is really, really important, and I think only the front half of the room heard what they were saying. Um, if you are a startup and you're starting a company, please start it in the Kansas City Startup Village. Here's why. Thank you, sir. First of all, big kudos to, um, to Nate and the Kauffman Foundation. Like, I, the labs is closed because they're restructuring it. This, this event's getting so big, and I think you're already outgrowing the reconstruction that you're doing, so I like it in here. This is pretty good. So yeah, we're up here uh, representing Kansas City Startup Village. I think some of you heard what we said earlier. Um, essentially, we're trying to create a dense community of startups in Kansas City. Um, it's a sprawling city in general. Um, and one of the things we want to do is create these collisions of ideas and people who are building their, uh, their startups to come together in the same area. Uh, this area is, uh, the area that's been selected is Hanover Heights for a variety of reasons, but if you are a startup, uh, as Ben said earlier, please uh, start it in Hanover Heights. There's some commercial space, there's some residential space. We're working with uh, both sides, uh, the Missouri and the Kansas uh, government sides to 
uh, work through the special permits to get uh, to allow startups to use uh, residentially zoned uh, homes so that they can work out of it. Plus, we've, we're going to be the first fiberhood to get Google Fiber, which is pretty cool. So um, soon, uh, the first KCSV house will be uh, surfing at gigabit speeds, which is going to be pretty awesome. So uh, there's a website, kcsv.org. If you want to check out more information, you can also contact us uh, that way. And there's a hashtag KCSV. So if you want to cruise around in the Twitterverse and see what's happening, that's good. So here, Ben. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to say from the startup perspective, um, Brad Feld writes about the density in his uh, startup communities book that just came out. He's, him and David Cohen started Techstars are pretty much single-handedly responsible for building Boulder into the tech startup mecca that it is. And what density gives startups is those serendipitous meetings that don't happen if there's not a density. Um, and so just as a startup, it's exciting to be able to go to a coffee shop and run into three or four other startup guys and just have conversations. And that's where some of the m most magical stuff happens is just random conversations. And what, I mean, really these guys are what are the leaders of it. I'm just, you know, one of the startups that c luckily is a part of it. Um, you know, Ben started Homes for Hackers and Matthew happened to own a building in Hanover Heights. And um, really, uh, I, I think this is a huge opportunity for Kansas City. Um, as I mentioned earlier, come by and check it out. It's 45th and State Line. At, um, uh, Local Ruckus, Forms App, or Leap2, iVerify, Square Offs, um, Trelly, uh, they're all, we're all there already. The first Homes for Hackers house is there already. Um, Mike uh, just came in from Boston. He's gonna be in there. So just come by, check it out. And if there's anyone that knows of someone looking for, you know, a startup looking for a space, definitely check out, um, you know, Casey Startup Village first. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. I'm glad that you guys received that message now. There, it is so much fun to go over there. It's so much fun to have talented, amazing little startups in this community and um, I think they're gonna they're all gonna grow and build that community um, so anyway without further ado I get really excited when we have startups um, we have a lot of software startups we have you know we cover the board in terms of you know everything from infrastructure to biomedics and nanotechnology but I get really excited about companies that create a product about hardware like you can touch it you know you can feel it you can use it and um, so it's my pleasure to present Gina and Andy from Innovating Solutions. Their product is called TapiQ. So if you love barbecue and, you're, uh, and if you're a part of the team for the American Royal, like this product is really cool. So I'm going to turn it over because this time is for them. Thank you, Nate. Um, before I start, I'll just show you um, a short video from our YouTube. So. Let's take a look at this. Hi guys, I've got the TAPQ system here to measure my temperatures of my chamber with my left and my right probes and then monitor the temperature of my meat with my left and my right meat temperature probes. And with this device, I can monitor my temperatures of my barbecue system wherever I'm at, whether I'm out in the yard playing soccer or home inside watching the football game or at my local grocery store, finding some supplies that I need. OK, uh, I won't show you the full video. Uh, let's just get started and tell you who we are and uh, what, we, what we do here in Kansas City. So we have our cool product called the TapiQ, and that's our marketing line. You'll always be one tap away from your barbecue. So. Um, who we are. We are Innovating Solutions. Uh, we are a mobile app and software consulting company. We started as a consulting company back in 2010, but since then we have evolved and made two products of our own, as well as we have other apps in the App Store, Android Market, and um, the Amazon Market as well. So um, these are a couple of our products, InnoDox and TapiQ. Today, I won't be talking more about InnoDocs, but I'll just tell you more about our product called the TapiQ. What the TapiQ is, is um, 
you know all what's a thermometer. So it's just a thermometer made Wi-Fi. So uh, TapiQ is essentially a Wi-Fi based remote temperature monitoring system that monitors your barbecue. And then like Jake said in the video, you can be anywhere, anywhere in the world and you'll be still able to get the temperatures of your uh, barbecue, your chamber and your probes. So uh, let me tell you how it works quickly because everyone is curious how you do this. So um, TapiQ, everyone has a home router and we connect our laptops and our mobile devices to our home router. The TapiQ connects to your home router just the way these other devices connect. So we have an installation program which you just hook up and enter your SSID and password of your network, uh, plug in your probes and your power supply and you're all set. So uh, I'll just quickly tell you how it works. Uh, whenever you connect the device and the probes, um, the TapiQ starts sending temperatures to the, what we call the TapiQ cloud. Uh, it's a server hosted by Andy Kalungbach in downtown Kansas City. It's our TapiQ cloud. So um, as, soon as, the temp uh, as soon as the cloud gets the temperatures, um, all the computing is done in the cloud and then notifications are pushed to a user's phone uh, through the cloud. So this is just the basic part of the TapiQ works. Now there are three main features to our device. Firstly, you can monitor the temperature. Um, you can set alerts. We'll say, hey, alert me if my temperature goes below 165 Fahrenheit and above 250 Fahrenheit. So you'll get notifications if your temperature goes above or below that range. And thirdly, the best part is you receive graphical data. Say you, you, you smoked a turkey last, oops. Oh, you, you smoked a turkey last Thanksgiving and you want to repeat that session. Like, oh, it, it tasted so good, I can't repeat that session. So with that, <laughs> you can uh, graph your data and then you can get all the hist hist historical data about your uh, smoking session. So as I know, Americans like to do three things. Um, that is watch football, uh, drink lots of beer, and barbecue. So we think we are in the right market, and so, <laughs> uh, so this is just a prototype of our app that shows how you can set alerts. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get back to the numbers now of uh, the smoking data, the grilling or smoking data as we call it. So there are, in last year, according to the Hearth uh, Patio Barbecue Association, there were 15 million grills and smokers just sold in 2010 in, in Canada and the United States. And 82% of the American households have a smoker. I guess most of the guys here might be having one if you are in between your 30s and your 60s. So, <laughs> so um, we, we think we have a good market. Uh, and this is just United States and Canada. And as we know, we have other countries in our mind as well. Australia last. So apart from this, I'll just tell you the current status of the project. We have a completely developed hardware prototype, which works. And um, we have it right now. I'll show it to you. Um, then we have web apps, which show you the current temperatures um, on your smartphones or tablets or laptops. and. Um, that's it, and then the next steps are to create rich mobile apps. We are a mobile app company, so we are good at that. And uh, designing a tooling for the casing of the device. We already have a manufacturer set uh, who's just waiting for our green signal that to go ahead and start manufacturing. So, uh, and yes, we are on Kickstarter currently. We have 15 days to go to meet our goal, although it looks a little hard right now. But uh, if you get a chance, please do go and visit our TapiQ page and please spread the word or uh, just back us. So uh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, let me show you the device. So we have our uh, hotspot connected right there. Most of you can't see it. And uh, TapiQ is right now connected to the hotspot there. And it is uh, transmitting the temperatures 
right now it would be the room temperatures that it's transmitting. So let me go ahead and I think show you. <clears throat> yep. So uh, the 12, don't get, don't freak out, the 12 is just a dummy temperature, 12 Fahrenheit, and two probes are connected. Uh, it's showing 75 and 77, and anyone can just go right now, whoever are in the room or anywhere else and see the temperatures at, uh, of, the, of the room. So that's what we have. Thank you. Let's open it up for questions. I have a question to get it kicked off. Sure. What are the current limitations of other devices that are out there? Um, I mean, I don't know if I would want to be like in another country and having a yeah. session somewhere sure. else, you know, but um, is it Bluetooth? Is it, I don't know, is, yeah. uh, why is this unique? And yeah, currently there are devices uh, that are RF, radio frequency. So uh, yeah, actually, yeah, that's it. So the red dot is the one with RF devices. So this is a house we've taken from Google Maps. And this is the range you get on an RF device. And Bluetooth is the one in the yellow, although you won't get such huge range on Bluetooth. But that's what iGrill says. So we've just put 200 feet. And with the TAPIQ, you can be like, you know, sometimes there are long smoking sessions, four hours, five hours. Like, so you can't be strapped to your smoker all the time you should have the freedom to go around and like we saw in the video, some last minute supplies at the grocery store or last minute emergencies, which you cannot help, and, but you have to leave. So that's what uh, the TAPIQ offers. I got a question. Okay. Yeah, um, this is just a prototype and we are still taking ideas and we will, like, we can put that option in to measure time because with the smartphone you can capture anything from the phone, start your timer, and then just if you transmit it over to our cloud, we can monitor all that. Yes, that can be definitely implemented because, like, when you pull up the smoking data, like, you put extra coal, charcoal after 15 minutes or so, you can make notes while you're smoking, and that would be part of our rich mobile apps that we will be developing. Yeah. So with the uh, recent American, uh, the American Royal Barbecue that came through, I could definitely see a lot of participants uh, making use of this technology. One thing I think that they would probably lack is the router, you know, yeah. seeing as they have tents. So do you guys have any plans to in integrate like uh, mobility um, so they can attach to mobile networks? Yeah, uh, currently we are looking into that. We want to make it uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi so that if you're in a remote area and you don't have a hotspot, then at least you have your Bluetooth to communicate. We are uh, looking into that. Yeah, but I do want to say that American Royal did have a hotspot that you could use. So there are places that have hotspots and it's easy to plug and play. You just, you would have to bring a laptop or something with a USB cable and then run the program to say what's the SSID and password, and it writes it on the device. So then you can use it with hotspots as well. But yeah, there are a lot of places that maybe don't have the hotspots is where we would like to eventually see if we could put Bluetooth and Wi-Fi together yeah. into the device. Yeah, but where the trend is going, um, all devices would be internet-based, and in the next five years, we are looking at smart devices that talk to each other, and that's where the trend is going. So I think we are in the right spot. Any so, I got a question. The, um, the difference between your product and other ones that are on the market, let me just understand this, is that uh, it's, a, it's a web app that is completely tied to a Wi-Fi, so you can, you can check it anywhere. Um, what, what's going to be so difficult for them to implement that? Because I think there are some, actually, that are actually doing that, um, what differentiates yourself? I know, I like your little diagram, but. Yeah. Um, 
Like, is it the software? Are you going to be able to sell this to them? or Actu what is Actually, the ones that are out there, we're doing it a little bit different from the ones that we've seen that are Wi-Fi. Um, we are having a cloud system where the ones that are out there right now are actually making the device itself a server where you're configuring it with the IP so all of your information is stored on your device. Ours is uh, different in that we're just using ours as a client and just transmitting to a cloud so that you have everything on a cloud. Um, so far, we haven't found one that works with the cloud. We're hoping that we can get out there first. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe if I can rephrase that question a little bit. Um, have you taken any steps, or can you take steps to actually protect this uh, to where somebody couldn't compete with you? Uh, and then if you can, I, I see this being a feature in the next iWeber, right? So. Uh, grilling companies start to differentiate their product with this and then you can do very much like the sports fan company you can do all kinds of things on top of grilling right it's a pretty big social activity large market that kind of thing and so I guess it's how hard is it to challenge you in this marketplace uh, have you taken any steps and then have you thought about partnering to kind of get because the other point is if you have the cloud solution then it's all about how many people are using it what do you do you know then you get into those kind of dynamics yeah, we, we are in the process of uh Looking at and getting a patent, we don't have one yet. Um, we have talked to an attorney, though, and we're in that process. I, um, the second question about, uh, we are working out a potential partnership with a uh, smoker manufacturer for distribution. So we are in the process of doing that as well. And uh, we have a champion barbecuer, Chris Marks. He's behind us as our uh, power user. He's the one who's out there spreading the word for us, and he's been doing um, promotional kind of things to help us. So we have those things going on. And being at the American Royal, we, we kind of rushed through this, but our Kickstarter came live, American Royal, and that was the first that anyone had ever heard of us. And since then, we've like been able to, uh, with Kickstarter, we've been connecting with the barbecue community. We've been talking to the barbecue newspapers. Uh, one of them is going to print an article on us, the Barbecue National News, Barbecue, uh, Kansas City Barbecue Society. We've been talking with their president. We've been talking with manufacturers. We've been talking with smoker people, especially the American Royal. We've been getting a following, creating our um, subscriber list of people and getting people who are saying they want to beta test with us. Yeah. What's the uh, price point of a tap -a queue? And do you have any uh, research around the viability of that? Yeah, currently we are looking at a price point with on Kickstarter. We are offering it at $169. Um, and um, we want to keep it close to that uh, uh, price point in the market. So, yeah. Have you done any research around the $169 price point uh, and market interest? Yeah, at American Royal, we told people about this and uh, they were really interested but because the Bluetooth device itself cost 100, 100 something dollars and they entered the marketplace with a price of I think 130 or something. So I think we are well placed and um, this concept is will be not only applied to barbecue industry but other industries as well where temperature monitoring is essential. So like my dad, he's a scientist in India and he had to monitor, um, so the reactions, they go on for a long period of time. And um, he just found out after three months that they were conducting the experiment at a wrong temperature. So if he had got alerts or if the temperature went above or below, that would have helped a lot. So this is just the market we are entering, but there is a broad market where we see it going with smartphones and the thing about everything being going, going to the cloud is because we can store information, we can give graphical data, which is very useful for people who carry out experiments and everything. So I think uh, the barbecue market is just a start for us. So thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, we were part first e scholar, yeah. 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 
Yeah, sure. Um, with these scholars, um, I think what I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Oh, Fanek. He 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 told about uh, the same thing. Even I was young and I started on it, and I could relate what he said. So uh, my experience was amazing. Uh, I didn't have any entrepreneurial um, like I I never wanted to start my own company or anything. But uh, after I went into the program, my mindset totally changed of how I look at things and what I can do and what I'm capable of. And the, uh, the e-scholars program, the people really helped us, and the mentors are really great. And actually, the manufacturer we have got is uh, one of the, our mentors set us up with uh, them. So we get a lot of help. We feel protected. We feel secured. And uh, I think it's been an amazing experience. And we have uh, like Andy Kalambak who takes care of the um, cloud. Uh, he's, he's our neighbor, so working with them, like instead of going somewhere and meeting like some other place or planning something, he's just, he was just, I mean, he just moved right now to the village, but, the, but like it's like you just go knock on the door and hey, I've got a problem. So it's like a community and that's, that's a really good experience of getting things done and um, everyone helping each other, so. Yeah, and yeah. they give the legal clinic as well, so that's where we're gonna get help with our patent, is through the legal clinic at UMKC. And like Andy yeah. said, the, uh, they're giving us uh, great mentors, uh, incubator space, and that's where we were actually with uh, Local Ruckus and with Andy uh, for Saberco and Form Zapper, and uh, we're with Galleon Labs. So we, we have that community too, so we really appreciate the support of just yeah. being around a lot of people. I think where we need help right now is um, we we uh, we have to get our cash flow going as well. So if you have jobs, mobile app jobs, we're looking to do custom work for people that help support us cash flow. If we don't do our Kickstarter, we might just have to self-fund all the things that we need to do. And part of the way that we self-fund is by doing um, software development. Yeah. Guns for, for hire for you. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, one thing I would like to tell is, uh, since I'm from India, uh, the spirit I see in Kansas City about uh, entrepreneurship and how people are passionate and they want to help each other, I think that is truly amazing. I have friends in other parts of the United States, but I never hear about all these things from any of them, even the ones in the Silicon Valley. So I think uh, we should give a round of applause for everyone who's here. and. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great community. All right, that was um, amazing to hear. Um, let's uh, give everyone one last round of applause and we are done for the day. Feel free to stick around, hang out, uh, try and connect with people, grab another cup of coffee if we have any left. And next week we'll be back in Kaufman Labs with our new and improved space. <laughs>